G'day everyone, this is Kevin Sam from Japanese Nature Car and here we are at Melbourne, Australia for the Classic Japan Car Show. Now, as you can see, the, uh, the weather is a little bit gloomy and in fact, all weekend, we've had all these warnings about torrential rain and in fact, yesterday, we had some minor flooding around uh, Melbourne. So, uh, I think the, the weather, the dire weather warnings have probably kept quite a few people away. Uh, but nonetheless, we've actually had a really, really good turnout of cars today. Now, this is only just a part of the show so we're going to do our best to do a little bit of a walk around and let you show have a look at some of the, the cool cars that are here today now we'll, this is of course a japanese starter car jnc project hakoska which you should be familiar with and this is the barrel brothers uh demo car cedric which um you've probably seen in our feed quite a bit in the last few days now, next to that is an ms50 crown wagon which um has a pretty cool little feature in the back and that this has actually got a third row of seats but the seats are, uh, you can see that very well, the seats are actually sideways facing. So these are for the children in your family that you don't like so much. Um, moving right along, ooh, well, quite a few nice cars on the other side. Here we are, all right. Now, this is a Corona. Uh, now, in Australia, this was a, this was available as an ADM model, this is a wagon, but this has got a little bit of a surprise under the hood in that this has got a 1J. Z engine, turn, twin turbo engine. So this is going to have a bit more of a sting in its tail uh, than the typical one. Now, haha, here we have an EF CRX. I was talking to Kasan at uh, Osaka JDM the last time we were in Japan, and he said that, well, even in Japan, the EF and the previous generation EA Civics are getting really, really hard to find. But for a lot of people of a certain age, um, they're really their favorite. And so that's, uh, that's, that's a little bit of a shame. Uh, so these are cars which are becoming quite sought after in good condition. Uh, but the, even in Japan, they're getting really, really hard to find. So this is really nice to see a good example. This is wrapped in like a matte pink, I think. Uh, example right here. This is available as a ADM, Australian, Australian available model uh, with the ZC twin cam. So we never got the B16A model, uh, which is a bit of a shame because uh, they were real rocket ships at the time. What else have we got? We got some crowns. We got some Corollas. KE Corollas, which are getting really, really sought after in, Japan, in Australia and very, very expensive because um, they can be turned into drifters very easily, kind of like a, a four-door version of any 86. Beautiful EFCR uh, Civic. And then we've got a GTR R32, rolling very nice and low on, uh, onto BBS rims and a Kajira crown. Kajira being Japanese for whale. Yeah. This has got the, I think, 4M motor, twin SUs. Pretty cool car. Now, being the coupe, it's got uh, some interesting styling. So the, the C pillar has got uh, that little bit of a feature emblem on it. It's got Venetian blinds. Yeah, very, very different from the, uh, much more glamorous than the Toyota sedans of the age. Now, behind us, we've got quite a few things. This is the Mint Land Cruiser. FD, Salikas, and here we have a nice 240Z. This one here is an R32 drift car. Now this has got the GDR grill and bonnet, but it's actually a GTS T Type M, I think. So it doesn't have the wide guards of the GDR. So this is a two wheel drive, two liter version. We're gonna talk a little bit more about the R32 series because there's quite a few other ones here at the show which are quite cool that I wanna go over. Um, beautiful. Drift Style FC. It's got the Aria Mimia drift mirrors, which are fared into the door. It's got a V mount. I don't know how much more we can see that. So this is actually going to be a pretty neat weapon for circuit and drifting. And it just sits just right in this vintage Yokohama alloys, or Yoko AVS alloys. Now this is a Sprinter, Corolla Sprinter SL. Now this runs a pretty. I know I was talking to the owner a little bit earlier, and it runs. A very, very hotted up 5K. Uh, so this does go very, very well. And it's a neat looking little car, isn't it? Uh, neat looking little car. This one, ah ha It's actually surprisingly hard to find a completely stock standard R32 GDR, but this one is one. Now this has done 60,000 miles. As you can see, it's bog standard and it's absolutely mint. Absolutely mint. So have a look at this. Wow, uh, 
the interior. I don't know how much you can see, but normally with R32s, the vinyl tends to shrink and lift off the um, that crease next on below the air vents, and this one's actually mint, so that's actually really, really rare. And things like the air vents uh, get very brittle with time, and these are really good condition. So I uh, think this is a very, very mint example. If you wanted to have an R32 GDR to salt away, this I guess something like this would be the thing. Now this is actually an Australian delivered R32 GDR, I think. Um, back in the day, uh, R32 GDR, of course, is a Japanese model, but there were 100 which were brought into Australia and sold as local models. Now, to make them compatible with local design rules, uh, there was about 200, I think, changes that had to be made to the car, one of which is that the indicators had to be moved from the inner to the outer light. So there's lots and lots of little bespoke changes that had to be made that, di that, that distinguish an Australian R32 GDR from a Japanese one. And this is an Aussie one. In a very, very popular period color, wine red. Absolutely fantastic. Wouldn't you love to have this in your garage? Just the way it is. Just the way it is. All right, now moving right along. Well, we might as well go to this car next. Now the R32, as you might know, is actually, of course, right at the top of the range of the GTR but uh, it was actually a whole range, uh, which also included the four-door uh, as well as the coupe. Now this is GTSD Type M sedan. Now, so this is kind of like a, a mid-spec model of the R32 at the time. So this has, would be equipped with an RB20, so straight six single turbo, putting out about 220 horsepower. Uh, so, and, and the way you can tell uh, between a GDR and a non-GDR, it's got narrow front guards and it doesn't have uh, the grill between the headlights, so it's got a bonnet that goes all the way down the bump. Now this is a GDST Type M. Uh, like I said, they put about 220 horsepower, so while they are not as special as a GDR, they really are kind of like 75% of, of, of a GDR, a stock GDR in terms of the way they drive, and of course when you add a little few modifications, you can quite easily match the performance of a GDR. So these are, and of course being a four-door, it's ultra cool. So I think these are, you know, unfairly um, ignored, uh, and to be honest, uh, they're getting really hard to find because uh, of the popularity they've had with the drift crowd. So it's really hard to find a really nice stock one. But I think, you know, wouldn't a nice R32 sedan like this, single turbo, two liter, with a few little period mods, wouldn't that be a nice daily? I think so too, or is one at one. Right, moving down the line, we've got some nice MA70 Supras. These were sold in Australia, although this particular one is not. As you can see, it's got a 2.5 twin turbo badge on the front. Now, in Australia, we got the 3 liter 7M turbo and non-turbo, just like the States did. So and this is one of them right here. But in the Japanese high performance model was actually the 2.5 twin turbo, which was the 1JZ motor putting up 280 horsepower. So a fair bit more power than the 7M uh, turbo models you found in the American models uh, and the rest of the world models. So this one would actually have quite a good turn of speed, 280 PS twin turbo early non BBTI. That's uh, you know a real sleeper. I'm moving right along on the rest of the show. Okay. Make sure I don't miss anything really cool. Oh okay, here we go. More EF Civics. And here we have a really nice RX4 or as they would call them in Japan, uh, Luce Coupe. Luce Rotary Coupe. Now this one, uh, being a Luce RX4, it has the 13B. Now this one looks like it's got, it's quite a tough motor, judging by the size of the extractor. So very possibly it's a bridge, it's got the Dundraft Weber. Uh, ultra sanitary uh, engine bay. And this particular model has been wrapped in a matte blue and it's slammed on rebarrel SSR Mark III's. Now these wheels were made by Barrel Brothers which are uh, a wheel restoration business in Sydney. Uh, and of course, we, we did a feature on those guys not that long ago. So if you have a look on the blog, you'll find it. Uh, this is a very, very mint Gazelle. Now in Australia, we got the Celica, we got the Gazelle, but we didn't get the high performance JDM versions. So this is just a single cam one, probably very similar to the model you guys got in the States. Oh, now let's do a bit of a pan. What have we got here? Now you're gonna see quite a few of these boxy R31 Skyline sedans today. And the reason why there's so many of them in Australia is because for a time during the 80s, the Skyline was manufactured in Australia as 
a family car, just a regular family car that anyone could afford, and it was the same price as she had a Camry or anything like that. Um, because in the 80s, uh, the Australian government was really trying to encourage more local production. So they managed to sweet talk Nissan into making a version of the Skyline here as a volume model. And this is it, this is the R31. So as a result, we've got quite a lot of these things still kicking around. They've got a huge amount of fans um, because, of course, they all sit under the halo of the, of the Japanese Skyline models. Now, the difference between the Australian and the Japanese ones, the, J the Australian ones have a single cam, three liter RB motor. Uh, putting out 114 kilowatts, about 160 horsepower thereabouts, and they have a solid rear axle. So very different to the Japanese models, which have an independent rear suspension and a turbo RB20 twin cam. But like these are so robust that, of course, the RB20 and RB26 motors drops right in, and they make a really, really good drift car. And so this is a very, very common look uh, for Aussie drift cars, and, and R31s are very, very popular. So going sideways here as a result. Um, also, you can tell the difference to an Aussie one and uh, the Japanese. Most Japanese t performance models are what's called a GT Passage, so they are a pillarless design where this has, re has regular doors, frame doors. Okay, what else can we find here? Very, very nice. That car, running a color matched. Injected L28, I think. Nice, nice. Uh, and we get to see some Supra, I saw it. Now this is the V8 version that you guys would have got in the States as well. Um, but there were quite a lot of Sauras imported in Australia even though they weren't available here as, a, as an official model. But um, with the V8 being most popular, this is an Australian delivered three liter turbo. Okay, MA70 Supra. This is another uh, Australian delivered, uh, Australian made R31 Skyline. This one's called a TI. Uh, quite sought after because it had these cool uh, aero wheels and it's got a really plush velour interior. So for uh, connoisseurs of the R31, these are really, really quite sought after. Uh, right. Over here we have the back of Roger Hakoska and we traveled down today with a couple of my friends who have some really nice 510s. Um, this one is, belongs to my friend Anth who runs BillThreads.com. Um, and it's got an FJ20 turbo engine. So super, super quick little package. Now, super, super quick little package. And this is a USDM, uh, two-door sedan. That's been converted to right-hand drive in Australia. Uh, and he's got full triple S interior, I think. Uh, although I think the gauge plus there was the, is the 3D printed one that allows you to put aftermarket gauges in. Oh, okay. What else do we have? Oh, so many things. All right. I think we're going to check out this RX3. RX3s are getting really, really expensive in Australia. You can pay up to about $80,000 for a mint one. So, so they're really very, very cherished and always have been. Um, they've always, the Aussie rotary scene has always been very vibrant. And so RX2s and RX3s have always had a really high market value. And this particular one has got a 13B turbo from uh, NFC and not just any turbo it's not standard because the turbo appears to be the size of a watermelon so this would probably go extremely well now um, old school rotors have always had quite a strong presence in Australian drag racing so hence it's part of the culture to re-engine them and uphold them quite a lot in contrast to this one which is a Capella RX2 um, Standard down to the hubcaps, although being Australian, you never really know. Um, the rotary culture here is all really about uh, repowering and up engine conversions, uh, and so you never really know when you see a grand prospect uh, rotary like this. So, uh, you never know if it's a sleeper or not. So it could be uh, have a bridge port, <laughs> could have a peripheral port. Uh, you don't know until it starts. Um, but this particular one, in terms of its appearance anyway, is absolutely gorgeous. It's like a khaki, uh, it's a khaki color. And I don't know how much of this you can see with the reflection, uh, but the interior of vinyl is absolutely mint. Very nice, very, very nice. And it's got the later uh, tail lights, which don't have, which lose out in the round lights, which are actually pretty cool. What else do we have here? We have some more drift step Corollas. 
We have a nice Corolla Stout, another Toyota Stout. Uh, very, very nice first generation RX-7. I'll walk around this crowd here. All right, now, oh, there's something over there that's quite interesting. As you can see, we get a lot of JDM S13s. Uh, we, in Australia, we get quite generous rules that allow us to import secondhand Japanese cars. So there's a lot of S13s in the country. Um, here is the later one with an SR20, uh, done up in a very, very uh, common sort of like a drift look with the mesh wheels. And this is an early one with the CA18 engine. So the CA18, uh, the S13 models in Japan came up with the CA18 motor to start off with, and this is the turbo model, which I think it's, I think they're 180 horsepower, where the later SR20 is 205. So this is an early one that probably would have been two-tone from the factory, but it's it's all single color now, and this is a, this is a later Kuki, Kuki model. Ah. Now this one's nice. In Australia, even though we do have a lot of imported JDM cars, imported second-hand JDM cars, something like this is very, very rare. I mean, the old-school Mitsubishis are really not very thick on the ground, and I do wonder why, because um, if you look at something like this, it's a, it's a 71 GDO MR, it's factory fitted with the over fenders and it's got all kinds of cool detailing. It's got a nice deep front spoiler, it's got the uh, bonnet scoops, over fenders. And it's got like the bumblebee touch, cuda touch stripes. Uh, so, so as far as performance car crit goes, I mean it's got everything. I mean these are powered by a 1600 twin cam, uh, 125 horsepower, so no work. Uh, exactly the same spec as the Toyota compatriots and uh, same power output as the Suzu Twin Cam. I don't know why these cars don't get more love. I mean, they're certainly very, very special in my eyes. Um, but as I said, extremely rare. All right, let's see, what else can we do? I think... <laughs> Billy Navara pickup. Uh, very, very lovely first generation Civic. And a Honda City, haha. -ha. Now Honda Cities, I don't think were available in the States. And I think they were available in Europe, Australia, but not in the States. Now this isn't, this is a very tiny little car. Not a K car, because they're 1300cc. So they're a little bit big in the K car, somewhere between a K car size and a, um, and a Civic. <laughs> and he's got the victory blast plate. So you have to, drive, have to have a sense of humor to drive something like this. Yeah, I think uh, whoever owns this, we could probably get along. We could, we can be friends. I think we can, we can definitely be friends. All right, nice. let's keep walking. Let's keep walking. There's so much more to see. Uh, and, and I really apologize to everyone if I walk past something that you consider to be really cool and I don't really spend any time on it, but, but there's just so much stuff to cover. Uh, AW11. Very, very nice AW11, super edition. I think this means it's a JDM version. Let's have a look. Yes, yes it is. It's uh, the supercharged version. Now I think you guys got the supercharged version in the States too, but uh, in Europe and Australia, we didn't. We only got the uh, normally aspirated for a GE, but this has got the supercharged in a cool version. My brother had a really nice one of these um, because there's a blitz supercharger pulley that you can fit and that raises the boost to 13 PSI. And, uh, you know, with a Cusco LSD and a Sparco water and a cooler, I mean, it was a beautiful package. It was a really lovely, grunty package. It's a shame that the AW11s don't really seem to have get, gotten as much love as the 86, because I think they're just as really, just as cool, especially the supercharged versions. I really am very fond of them. Now, while we're on the subject of Toyotas, uh, hang on, before we get to the Toyotas, it's a 929 here. In Japan, it would have called Cosmo. It would have been available with a 12A Turbo. But this is definitely not a 12A Turbo. It's a Lexus V8. It's a very unusual power plant for a Mazda Coupe of the era. And as you can see, it's an absolute sleeper. So this would be something worth keeping an eye on. Ladies and gentlemen. And uh, this is another rarity. Subaru first generation, Subaru Leone four wheel drive. Now it's been years since I've seen something like this. Absolute years. How long has it been since you've seen the first generation four wheel drive? 
Um, Leone. Let's spend a little bit more time looking through it. Definitely owned by enthusiasts. He still has the log books. And the interior is pretty mint. Wow. What a cool car. I could so totally rock this. That's a daily. Or every other daily. Now there's a really nice car over here that I want to show you. And we better cover it before I forget. Or before someone puts down the bonnet. Now here's a a Celica T22 GT. So this is a JDM model. It's only just arrived in Australia like about a month ago, and it is absolute perfection. I mean, look at that. It's mint hubcaps, and it's got the, the, the factory screw-on uh, chrome uh, stainless trims. Uh, the interior is to die for. And have a look at the engine bay. So this is the JDM GT version, which means it's a 2TG twin cam, 115 horsepower motor. It's got the twin Solexes. And yes, a bunch of bananas uh, extractors are actually standard. So have a look through this engine bay. This is so totally nice. It's so nice to hear that you can still find cars like this in Japan. Um, and because to build a car like this to this level would be so hard and cost will be such a labor of love. So it's just lo nice to know that you can still find standard cherished cars like this in Japan. Um, over here, MS50 Crown, Rat Rod. Uh, this looks like a lot of fun. Now it's got a fair bit of patina and, excuse me guys, and the owner sort of played it up completely with some uh, fa deliberately faded livery on the side, Crown Lager. Crown Racing, of course, in Australia, Crown Lager is a type of beer, and that's the font of it, so he's just riffing off. Uh, and here we are. This is a 4M, is it? 6M. 6M, oh, sorry. This is a 6M. <laughs> it's a 6M straight six with the twin SUs. Very nice. Thanks, buddy. Now this is a car that we did a Facebook video on yesterday. Beautiful TA22. He's he's actually from Sydney with me. Uh, uh, things to note: it's got over fenders on it, and perfectly fitted uh, Hayashi Techno wheels. Now these have been out of production for so long, and it's so rare to find them in a staggered size that fits just right. So these are ex these are unicorn wheels, really, in the one piece. Um, and you can see it's got the racing jacket fairing in the front, an aero jacket. So this is as a racing livery, fun car. This, and I can tell you, this ran the motor counter yesterday and it makes all the right noises. So this, this is an absolute, absolute gem of a car. Would be so much fun to drive. As with this Toyota Sports 800. I don't see too many of these in Australia. Now a little uh, 55 horsepower, uh, two cylinder Targa sports cars um, they're so small let me see if I can get you some perspective uh, of this car next to something else uh, but look how tiny it is look how tiny it is compared to this Haha. <laughs> so this was this is really really small K car size thing uh, but you know they can even though it's such a important part of Toyota's history and heritage I mean you can still pick these up relatively affordably I don't know why more people don't they look like a lot of fun over here we have a cappuccino. Um, I've driven one of these with an upgraded uh, turbo and running 40 psi. It was a lot of fun. I mean, the best way I can explain is that it feels like a smaller, narrower MX-5. Uh, I mean, this is a tiny, tiny car. Uh, you can see just by the size of the man standing next to it, it's tiny. I mean, it feels smaller than your bedroom. Uh, so, and, and being a K car, of course, it's powered by 660 cc triple and it's got a tiny little apple sized turbo in there somewhere in stock form they put out 64 horsepower but this is a tiny car that doesn't weigh anything so um it, they're actually a whole lot of fun as i said it feels like a three-quarter scale mix five to drive and when you play with the boost a little bit then uh, the performance is really very respectable okay just quick pan around 
What else have we got? A nice TE27 Levin. Ah. Every, every year now this car was at the Motocana yesterday. Did very, very respectably. Is that a 2TG? Yes. 2TG, yeah. Some, uh, minor mods. Yeah, 2TG with some minor mods. Now, notice it's got a Remora uh, Sanyo air intake, which is got... Oh gosh, what's that? Something, a surprise inside. <laughs> Can you tell me something about what, the, what we're looking at here? Yeah, it's fuel injected. It's fuel <laughs> injected, oh my God. Yeah. So Still keeping the carbies as the throttle bodies, but yeah. put fuel injector up before the throttle bodies. Right, right, right. Okay, well, first, the, this is full of surprises, guys. Now, first is a remote, there's a vintage Remora Sanyo air intake. So this would, in back in the day, have replaced the restrictive air box that uh, the 2TG Toyota would have come with, with a more free-flowing one. Normally, that would be like a, a round pancake filter there. But, 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 the, old, the very, very enterprising owner has uh, converted the... Oh, yeah, here we go. That's what it looks like. So in of itself, this is a super cool engine bay that any JNC reader will be proud to have in their garage. But the surprise is the Solex carburetors have been converted, have been gutted, and the whole thing runs um, fuel injection, and the fuel rail is actually hidden inside the airbox itself. Absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Well done. Well, well done. Oh, well, we're going to keep wondering, but thanks, mate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Full of surprise. Oh, here we go. Look, look. Hidden fuel rail. Ho ho! All right. Come on. Celica. Mitsubishi GDO. Now, you know, at JNC, we really like these. Um, there's going to be a few other ones uh, that we're going to have a closer look at in the other part of the show, but, you know, we really do like these GTOs, you know. I mean, uh, a lot, I think we. They really get a bit of a bad rap uh, from enthusiasts, I think, because they, they weren't as sharp or sporting or powerful as a, uh, as a GTR or a GTO or, or as sharp handling as an FD. But you know, you, something like an FD, you would compare to a Porsche 911. Um, something like a GTO, you would compare to a Porsche 928. And as a long distance, or a Mercedes SL, uh, and as a long distance, a comfy cruising car uh, with a bit of power and a bit of handling, I think they're hard to beat. And they've got that early 90s vibe that's just really so, so appealing now. Alright, the 2 GDR. Haha, -ha. let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. A86. Yes. Oh, you 86 Otaku. You're going to kill me if I don't focus on some A86s. Beautiful Trueno. Uh, running on. Brand new work equips. And it's got carbon fiber bonnet and it stands just right just right just right this would be it'd look really good in my garage I had an 86 long time ago fabulous car I had so much fun with it um, and, and this and this guy said the right idea now before we move on I'm just gonna do a quick pan around here and I have to cover this car now if you are on Instagram you have to look up an account called 80s hero that's 80s hero on uh, Instagram and uh, like the name says he searches out all kinds of 80s memorabilia and this whole a aw11 is a shrine to the 80s it's absolutely mint inside and out um, I had a good look under the under the bonnet and in the engine bay and you could eat off it so many nice little details like for example that uh, you can see they're Recaros, uh, which have been um, re-upholstered with a tartan that's been uh, reflected in the door cards. Uh, and if you're an MR2 Otaku, get a load of this. This is the optional JDM Ski Rack. These are so unbelievably rare. Unicorn stuff, but uh, it's the JDM Ski Rack uh, for people back in the day who went skiing in their two-seat roadsters. I'm a two-seat uh, sports car. Uh, pure correct with the uh, with the aero wheels so nice uh, moving along this is a JB stereo uh, showing a little bit of patina being an early with JB stereo doesn't have a it doesn't have a second generation one it doesn't have the bonnet scoop uh, it doesn't have the flares of the Amer later American and um, Australian ones uh, American and Japanese ones 
another nice 86. And this is a Sora. Now, plenty of Sora's in the States, of course, but you guys only got the um, 1J, normally aspirated, and, uh, and V8 models, where this is our 2J, uh, where this is the 1JZ 2.5 twin turbo JDM model. And uh, B, actually, no, it's the later model. So I think this is a single turbo 2.5 uh, 1JZ uh, with VVTi. Uh, so this is a, a really, really, really nice engine that suits this car. Uh, they came in manual with an LSD, um, 280 horsepower and a ton of torque from the VV VVTi single turbo. So uh, this is, uh, of course, very stanced. Let's get that out of the way. It's very, very stanced. But uh, great driving car. Basically, 90% a, a of a Supra. Uh, it's, a, it's a shame that... Uh, the, the US and European markets didn't get this, the, get this version. Um, get some nice Mazdas, yeah. Mazda Cosmo. Ah, what more can you say? Mazda's first um, rotary powered vehicle. Now, this one's an L10B. So, this is like a facelift uh, version. Now, you can tell because it's got the longer wheelbase, so it's got a bit of a gap between the rear wheel and the back of the front door. Uh, the early ones uh, had a shorter wheelbase and they lengthened the wheelbase to, to make the handling a little bit more stable. Uh, so this is a later version uh, with a 10A uh, rotary engine and just such timeless styling. Uh, it really is kind of like a jet age look that, you know, for a, for a future that never came. Um, so swoopy. Next to that is another rotary gem which is a Cosmo. Now these things you definitely didn't get in the USA or Europe. Um, but there's a few, quite a few of these floating around in Australia. This is a, uh, the top of the line one. So it's, uh, it's got the tan leather interior. Now normally it's very hard to find this interior with um, all the plastics and the color uh, in mint condition, but this is a really good one. Uh, and these normally have a big problem with the, um, the digital display for the HVAC and center console um, braking. Uh, but this, but uh, that's been the main thing that sidelines a lot of these cars. And this is the 20B. 20B, triple rotor, 280 horsepower sequential turbo. So this predates the FD double, double rotor, uh, which ostensibly has the same 280 PS, but of course this has 50% more capacity. So this is the engine you want. Um, Surprisingly, there's been a low survival rate of these things, even in Australia, uh, and especially in Japan. I think because the uh, rebuild costs of the 20B are very high, 50% more engine uh, than an FD means 50% more cost. And uh, with the challenges you have with the digital interior and everything, uh, I think this, this they've been an expensive restoration. Um, there's been an expensive restoration uh, proposition for a long time as a result. Uh, while they're very appealing now, I think there haven't been that many survivors, both in Australia and Japan. Uh, this is my friend Tony's car. Uh, this is his track ready Z32 300 ZX with Nismo wheels. So uh, Tony works for, Tony's a car motoring journalist, and uh, this has got uh, all kinds of really nice period stuff. It's got the Nismo wheels, it's got Nismo suspension. Uh, so um, he's an enthusiast that's really sought out all these rare parts from overseas. And as you can see from the stickers on the side, uh, it's mainly a 90% track car nowadays because he's uh, because he gets uh, to drive other people's cars for free, don't you, Tony? All right, and this was the FJ20 uh, FJ20 uh, 510 we covered before. It's got the latest supersonic grille, very very nice. And I think we're done with the top part of the show. Uh, so I'm going to mosey on down to the bottom part of the show where there's a lot more cars. Class 2 Corona. Work equipped. So nice that work still makes these uh, nostalgic wheels. Now, uh, the Classic Japan Car Show is brought to you by Tita Car Club of Australia, Victorian branch. So there's always some really, really nice Toyotas here. Uh, this is a nice 2000 GT liftback. R28s with the longer nose, I think. Very, very nice. Now this particular one is got. Is this an 18RG? Is the motor an 18RG? Ah, yeah. So this is the 1800 
uh, twin cam 18R G motor. Not the 2T TG of uh, 1600 we saw in a few other cars. It's got lovely twin Likunis. Just a beautiful example. Here's a GTR R32. Nice. We have some little vans. And another Celica. Another Celica with another 18RG. Whoa. So nice. I think this is a nice engine bay. Deserves a second look. How about them apples? Cab plated bolts. Good on you, mate. Whoever owns this car, if you're watching this, good on you for putting in the effort. Another Aussie uh, R31. And here we have the Honda Civic Shuttle. Yes, we have them too. And yes, they're also sort of here as well for case swaps. And Panda Torino. Uh, so somewhere, someone is waiting for their tofu and being bitterly disappointed that it hasn't arrived. And uh, here we have a whole bunch of really cool stuff. Now, this is a vendor by the name of JDM Parts at Ruprecht. You can look him up on, uh, you can look it up on um, Facebook. Uh, but he is a JDM hunter for rare stuff. And this is their demo car, which is a AZ1 Mazda Speed. Well, actually, it's a AZ1 Autozan, which is a K car mid-engine. So it's actually my favorite K car of the period. Uh, this particular one has got some modifications. It's got a Mazda Speed uh, Vented Bonnet. It's got a, low, a body kit by Madhouse. So if you look at the uh, Ford, S Ford RS200 Group B rally car of the era, the, uh, the Madhouse body kit actually riffs off that with the, with the fog lights and everything. And, and you can see how small this thing, and judging by those two guys that stand next to it, it's really like waist height. And unbelievably compact. Unbelievably compact. Here we have a triple cylinder Suzuki twin cam four valve cylinder turbo motor making 64 PS, which is more than enough power to make this a, a barrel of fun. So that's JDM Parts at Ruprecht. Look him up on Facebook. He has got all kinds of cool stuff. If you want anything from Japan, he's a good man to know. If you want those HKS instant noodles, he's got a box of them. So, yeah, look them up. Now we're going to move to the second part of the show. Um, a lot more cars to cover. A lot more cars to cover. Now, unfortunately, the weather or threats of bad weather have kept a lot of people away. So, uh, this is not actually as big a crowd as um, we were expecting. But nonetheless, there's still a lot of really sweet cars that uh, we're going to talk, talk you through. Beautiful Fairlady Z on Equips. Uh, here's a Galant. Here's a Galant with a little bit of a surprise because it has a Lancer Evolution twin cam four cylinder turbo motor. Now, Normally these are a bit of an effort to fit in these things, so the owner has actually done a few things. He's flipped the exhaust manifold to make that so the, the turbo sits higher up, so it's got some clearance. And the inlet manifold has been chopped and the throttle body has been flipped from the left side to the right side. And it just looks so utterly sanitary, so uh, well done. Some really nice top-notch fabrication work. Looks so neat. Uh, another Corolla. First generation uh, Town Ace, uh, which in Australia, oh, it's called a Tarago. Hilux, more Corolla, Silica G4, crown faced Hilux, uh, coffee from uh, first generation Nissan Cubes. Now we come across some MA70 Supras here. Now this is another. Uh, JDM 2.5 twin turbo 1JZ model. Uh, some of the JDM ones are actually narrow body. So uh, in Australia and in the USA, we've got the wide body super. There are actually narrow body flat side ones, but this is a, as a wide body. Uh, this is a um, an Aussie three liter turbo one, but it's got, I think, the, I think this uh, vent 
in the front bumper is a Turbo A homologation one. The Turbo A model was like a, a facelift, limited edition model they made in Japan to homologate certain aero parts and turbo parts for Group A. Um, because, but which then the rules for Group A said that you had to make a certain minimum number of production cars with certain upgrade features. And so I think they had uh, a slightly different turbo and different suspension and of course uh, a little things like the different aero uh, to make the Group A race cars work a little better. So I think that is that big scoop over there. Now, so this is not, I think, a turbo. I don't believe this is a Turbo A either because I think the Turbo A's are all in black. So this has just got the Turbo A front bumper. But nice little detail for all you Toyota otaku out there. Nice. Woohoo, friends. All right, moving right along. Now this is just so nice. I, you know, as I said before, at JNC we really love the Mitsubishi GDO. I mean, it's such a wonderful car of its time. Um, the later model, of course, uh, is maybe mechanically a little bit more desirable because the later model has got the um, six-speed gearbox uh, and it was a little bit lighter with all the active aero taken out and if, uh, but however the early model in my mind just looks so of its time you know it's, it's got this really early 90s JDM detailing and it's absolutely gorgeous I mean I think Ben uh, ben Shu from JNC said that you know in certain colors it looked like a Gundam and I think so I think I absolutely agree uh, it looks like it's a JDM robot car <laughs> that would transform into some sort of giant robot in the moment. Uh, that's why we love it. Look, I don't know why we don't get uh, more of uh, more love for these things because I think that they're really good cars. Now this is a Nissan President. Now you might not know what this is. I mean, everybody knows what a Toyota Century is, but since the early 70s, I think maybe 1970, uh, Nissan has had its version of uh, a big limo for uh, CEOs and you know senior government officials to uh, as a rival for the century and this Nissan president uh, it's definitely a little bit more American dare I say and it's styling and then the Toyota century it's a lot more squared off um, definitely very kind of mid 70s Chevy look doesn't it uh, but it has got a 4-litre V8, I believe. Uh, it's like a hemi-head, small V8, only putting out about 160 horsepower because these things aren't really about high performance. They're really about wafting your boss between meetings in the most comfort possible. And inside, <laughs> it's got the most insane, thick, velour interior. Um, and there's one little feature, I don't know if, I can, if the camera's going to show it very well, but um, the front seat, can you see it? It's got like a hole in it. Uh, what it is, is um, the back, a portion of the backrest falls down. Uh, and so the CEO uh, lounging in the back seat can actually stick their feet out onto the front seat and stretch out. Um, <laughs> it's got... Uh, a tape deck player in the uh, center console and it's got a stereo in the center console uh, so this is absolute 70s JDM VIP excess as it existed in the time um, it's as you can see on the side of the center armrest it's got uh, electric controls for the um, for the back seat so the back seat actually adjusts you can actually recline it and slide it forward. So it's a, you know, kind of like a, fur, like a business class airline seat, all in an early 70s V8 package. Why don't more people get into these? I don't know. I don't really know. I mean, these are a cool little package. Uh, this is a GT, this is an R31 JDM. Uh, we talked about the sedans that were made in Australia. This is a JDM Coupe. So this is a, a GDSX. Uh, it's got the GD or spoiler, which everyone goes crazy over, the spoiler. <laughs> the spoiler actually flips up and down. And these were part by an early RB20 twin cam single turbo putting out 180 horsepower. So compared to the DR30 before, which is more of a sporting lightweight model, uh, these were more of a gadget laden, heavier, uh, luxury personal car for the mid 80s. Uh, they're a little bit softer, a little bit understeer, so it's not sporting as, as maybe a DR30. But of course, in the racing model of GDs R, uh, was actually extremely successful in this day. Oh, what else can we show? Uh, here's another 
JDM Coupe and you can see that it's got an RB20 because it says all that stuff down the side. High cast of course being the four wheel steering. The JDM model test. Now this white car is um, of course it's an Australian deliver uh, Australian made uh, Skyline sedan but back in the day uh, Nissan Australia actually had a performance division called SVD special vehicles division and they made uh, a certain limited number of sporting uh, Skylines these are all based of course on the Australian delivered um, Australian made Skyline sedans and these had uh, Nismo cams uh, these had a different ECU, these had extractors, and they made a lot more power. So instead of, 100 and, um, instead of 114 kilowatts, these had more like 141, uh, and they had Nismo suspension and an LSD. So these are really, really nice, very, very drivable uh, performance car of its time. Actually, uh, having driven these on track compared to the JDM Turbo Coupes, I actually prefer these. Uh, these are, have a much better balance than the, um, than the uh, Japanese models which the, with, with the rear wheel steer high cast. Uh, so I find the uh, uh, the torque and the response, the handling balance of the Aussie SVD cars were probably the high point of the i31 series. Here we have a Nissan Cedric, which I think this is an Australian 300C. And here we have a Nissan Prince GT. I mean, not a Nissan Prince GT, but a Prince GT. Now, Prince was kind of like a Lexus in its day. Uh, it was a premium car maker, but unfortunately by the mid-60s they were kind of broke. Uh, so Nissan took them over and from 1968 onwards the Skyline became badged as a Nissan. Now what is this? This is the mid-size car, family car called the Prince Skyline GT. Now this has got a 2 litre straight 6 running triple Webers. Uh, this was putting out I think 125 horsepower in the early 60s and this was a proper thing a homologation special 100 liter fuel tank uh, lsd fia certified the whole nine yards now unfortunately uh, while prince was great at making performance cars uh, they weren't so great at making money so they went broke and this and bought them over but this is really the first japanese high performance car so this is a 1964 onwards model um, back when uh, japanese sports cars like the s800 or a Toyota or the Honda S600 and 800 were only making about 60 horsepower. This was a performance car with 125 horsepower. Uh, so this was really the beginning of hot rod sports sedans in Japan in its, uh, in its tradition that went on for a very, very long time. So this is the beginning of the whole Skyline performance legend. It really is. Um, and being a Prince, uh, there's also some really cool touches. They were really, they really lost money on every car they made. So. Uh, the cars were a bit better than what they were sold for. Just gorgeous. Now, the thing about a Prince GT is that this came out with a 1500cc four-cylinder. Now, the six-cylinder, as you can see in this car, barely fits. Now, what they had to do uh, was they had to lengthen the, the four-cylinder chassis. So, you can see there's actually quite a big gap between the door and the, and the front fender well uh, because they added eight inches to the uh, nose of the car to fit the six-cylinder. Now in the early cars, uh, you can actually see there's a welded in panel uh, behind that heater hose that's about 8 inches long. This is a later car where it's actually one piece. But super, super important um, ja high point in Japanese motoring history. Uh, they are, and they're really, it's really cool that they're starting to become more recognized and sought after. What else do we have? Now, uh, I apologize if my battery dies out because I think I'm down to 10%. So if this live feed suddenly stops i'm sorry let me see i might have to call a day and recharge it and i tell you what that's exactly what i'm going to do just so that we don't lose everything i'm going to call it a day at this point stick my stick my phone on charge and i'm going to do part two video shortly so part two is the rest of the car show uh so give me a couple of hours to get some charge to my battery and uh, we'll pick up where we left off